OK, so I'm really just going to focus on the things I've learned in VR because, uh, you know, there's some plenty of mistakes I've made. And uh, as you can tell from the title, I'm trying to kind of uh, uh, encourage everybody else to avoid them. Uh, so uh, I'm going to rip through this stuff fairly quickly. Uh, firstly, uh, frame rate. Um, VR, often you can, you can produce things at 60 frames a second or you can do them at 30 frames a second. Obviously, a 60 frame a second file is twice the size. So decide early on whether you really need a 60 frames a second output. As long as the VR headset or the viewing system is, uh, is updating at 120 hertz, you get a nice smooth panning effect and you probably don't need to go all the way to 60 frames a second. That's uh, one thing. Uh, project dimensions. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with the Google Jump platform at the moment. That's a 5760 uh, frame in stereo, so that's 5760 by 5760. That's a pretty big uh, size frame. But you can halve that when you're working in your, in your edit down to 2880 uh, to make your rendering times whilst you're in the offline a lot faster. And uh, that means that you can get your cuts approved by people because you're not spending hours doing the renders. Um, so that's a little tip there. And then in Final Cut, you can actually um, you can upscale it back at the end of the project, back to 5760 for your final deliverables. Um, OK, next one, proxy workflow. Same thing with the, uh, with the Google Jump system. Because the file sizes are so big, um, uh, you are inevitably going to have to be uh, proxying inside Final Cut, or certainly that's what I find is the most easy way to work. In fact, what normally happens, uh, Google will give you uh, uh, lower quality footage that you can start off with, but you will be eventually switching out to the high quality stuff. And they only provide the option to give you the entire take all the time. So what, the way I deal with that is I put everything inside compound clips, and then when I need to go to the, you know, when I need to online something, I just drop the high quality footage into my same compound clips, upscale the uh, project to 5760, and press, press export, and then go home. Um, look at it in the morning. Uh, we'll fix it in post, in VR. No, you won't. Basically, it's really, really hard, especially in stereo. I mean, you, there's plenty of stuff you can do in post. I mean, there's a team at Jaunt that uses Nuke and plenty of other tools to do that sort of thing. But, you know, if you can solve a problem in a VR shoot without having to fix it in post, great. Do that. You know, find some mechanism to avoid, the, you know, if you've got to, if you, normally the problem is that you can see the camera operator. Well, if that is a problem, find some way to make the camera operator part of the scene or, you know, de design your story in a different way. Um, same thing with the uh, with rig removal. The Google uh, the Yi camera doesn't have a, a, a downward facing camera. It completely removes, uh, you know, about eighty percent of the hard work people are doing trying to get rid of drones and trying to get rid of footprints and uh, tripods and things. So think about that before you shoot it. You know, do you even need to see the image down the bottom? Nobody's looking down there anyway. If they are, they're just uh, incorrect. Um, uh, stereo. Is it really necessary for you to do a job in stereo when you're working in VR or 360? It may well not be. 90% of your views will be on Facebook or on YouTube. Those people aren't looking in stereo. Uh, and the complexities involved in all the post-production pro process in stereo are four to eight times harder. I mean, you won't be able to patch stuff easily. You won't be able to kind of... A lot of the rig removal problems are much more complex in stereo. So have a think about that. Do I really need to be in a stereo workflow for whatever, you're trying, whatever story you're trying to tell or whatever, you know, whatever thing you're designing? Um, jump gamma. Again, the Google Jump system has a proxy. They deliver you low, lower res proxies at 2880 by 2880, and then the high res uh, 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 versions, which you're supposed to be online with. Those high res files have a gamma problem, which needs to be corrected when you, when you, you can basically, you can, we convert them to, pro, to ProRes uh, to get a higher quality, just because in Final Cut, it just it works so much simpler in ProRes. But there, you will need to perform a correction, which I can't particularly tell you about, because somebody else more technical than me does that at Jaun. But essentially, uh, the, the black levels are off in the high quality footage coming out of the Jump platform. So be aware of that if you're using Jump for any deliveries. Um, audio panning. In, uh, in Final Cut and in Premiere Pro, you can, you, know, you can reorient the camera view so that you can bring the action back to the center of the, you know, the, center of the frame. When you're doing that, you need to remember when you're going to go out to your sound mixer, he's going to need to know those numbers because otherwise his ambisonic recordings will be off by whatever degrees you've moved the camera by. So, you know, bear in mind that uh, if you're doing a lot of panning, you're going to have to go back through the cut, copy those numbers down, and don't annoy your audio mixer. Um, <laughs> the, really, the reason I put this in is because uh, my workflow, I use uh, an app called X2, I can't remember what it's called now, it's, uh, it basically goes out to Pro Tools, so I think it's called X2 Pro Audio. Basically, that bakes out an, an AAF file which contains all of the audio elements and it throws them into different tracks for people. I recently did a job at Jaunt where the AAF file had 97 tracks. 
which annoyed my audio mixer. So try and think about them. Their job's already really hard if they're audio mixing in spatial audio and, and they've got a, you know, a lot on their plate. So be kind to them, don't annoy them. Don't annoy your VFX team, same thing. Uh, the workflow turnover has to be simple enough for them to be able to uh, work in without having to constantly go back to you, write emails, what's the time, code? what's the endpoint? is there a reference? Think about that, that side of things, make it easier for them. They have, they're expensive, they're on tight timelines, and their job's already difficult. So do whatever you can to make that slightly simpler for them. Quite often they don't even work with time code, they work with frame counts, so you need to be mindful that all the things that we take for granted, like EDLs and XMLs, may not work in their ecosystem. Uh, mixing stereo and mono. Uh, there's a paradigm that says you should never mix stereo and mono footage. Why not? It's actually fine. Quite often we will use the um, we will use a stereo, a beautiful looking stereo shot early on in a piece, so people think, oh, I'm watching stereo, and then if we need to go to mono cameras, because it's an action cam or some other kind of reason that we're using monos, people stop noticing. It's quite okay to go from mono to stereo. It doesn't really interfere with the, uh, with the vision too much. Uh, so I would recommend doing that. Uh, stereo titles. Um, when you're working in stereo, obviously objects that you're filming have depth and some objects can be quite close to you. If you're putting titles over the top of those objects, it's really important to make sure the title appears in front of the closest object. Um, if not, you'll get what's called a stereo conflict and uh, it will render the piece sort of unwatchable, makes you go a little bit cross-eyed, but everything, you start getting a lot of double images. Your, basically, your mind can't resolve the paradox that it's seeing. Be mindful of that in stereo titles. That's also useful to uh, check those in the in a headset view. You can't really see if the stereo's conflicting incorrectly or if there is a stereo conflict without looking at stuff in a headset. Producer's best friend. This is a little plug for some friends of mine. Um, producer's best friend, that's the way that I get the information out of uh, Final Cut and give it as a, as a list, basically, to the VFX teams. It's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty useful piece of kit, um, but it does have one caveat, which is if you're mixing frame rates in VR, uh, quite often some of the numbers can be a little bit off. So, uh, so, for example, if you've got a 30 frame a second timeline, but you're throwing in 50 frame a second footage or 25 or so, if you mess with the, with the, with the frame rates, it can upset producer's best friend. So you will need to check if you're using producer's best friend as part of your uh, VFX uh, pipeline or your, your turnover pipeline. Um, Alex 4D, another plug for another friend of mine. Uh, he has made some plugins that I find indispensable. Primarily, there's a little, there's a little masking tool that is very useful in, um, in Final Cut Pro. So, you know, if you are going to be working... Um, uh, in VR, uh, check out his plugins. Uh, he is a very nice chap. Uh, don't be timid. There's a lot of uh, 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 momentum towards making VR things quite, uh, quite calm and quite, uh, quite, I think, quite boring, actually, in a lot of cases. I come from a commercials and music video background where you were always trying to be exciting and kind of like, wow, all the time. That's also true in VR. Just because it's VR, don't relax and think, oh, yeah, it's, it's special enough. It's not. Make it really interesting. <laughs> make these things, you know, make them fun uh, as if they were a TV commercial or a music video. Uh, don't pan the camera. You can reorient the camera inside the editorial tools uh, and you can keyframe that so you can actually, do that. most people don't do that because it does make you feel a bit nauseous. However, if you've got an interesting uh, uh, character or an actor walking through the frame, you want, as long as there's something that will drag the eyeball, you can avoid the nausea problem. It won't work in every case, but it can be done. I've seen it done, I've done it myself. You can pan the camera in certain conditions, but there has to be something for the viewer to be locked into so they don't just feel slightly sick. Um, checking the HMD. I think I touched on this with the stereo titles. Um, even with two, three years of experience, I still catch myself out because I haven't been looking in the headset all day long. And then I look at the cut, and it's a completely different experience. So, you know, if you have access to the headset, great. You know, use it all the time. If you don't, it's becoming much more easy to attach them to Macs. Uh, the prices are coming down. Um, so I would thoroughly recommend, if you're, if you're really serious about working in VR and uh, immersive reality, then, then get the headset. It will pay for itself. Uh, deliverables. Uh, there's often different kinds of deliverables. You might have YouTube, you might have Facebook, you might be delivering to a phone, you might be delivering to all sorts of things. So uh, you are going to have to be on top of your specification for the deliverables. I can't particularly speak to which ones I have to do all the time because Jaunt has its own platform for basically baking out all those different flavors. But there is a website called Purple Pill where they, they cover this stuff in quite a lot of detail. There's plenty of resources out there, but you, know, you will have to know... Uh, again, you know, your frame rates, your file sizes, there's often naming conventions for Samsung phones, things like that. So it will be important to kind of you know, check on that before you get stuck into a job and you're on a deadline and you haven't done that, you kind of get kind of screwed up. Um, color correction, VR cameras, unless you're using RedCam or something like that to do a kind of back-to-back -back fish eye thing, 
the files are normally not uh, heavyweight enough to do really good color correction. We're still waiting for ProRes RAW cameras or some kind of capture system where we can get a much more robust uh, uh, signal out of the cameras to, to do really beautiful color correction as opposed to just balancing it out and making it not look you know, yellow or green or whatever it is that's coming out of the jump. So that is a thing to bear in mind. If you're used to working with the Canon D3s or Canon whatever, you know, any other camera, you've got a lot more control over the color correction later. With VR cameras, what you're shooting is pretty much what you're going to get. You don't have so much latitude. Uh, directors, be nice to them. They're having a hard time in VR. I mean, probably they're not really used to it. Uh, they are um, often very overworked. Uh, I like directors. I think they're great fun. Uh, they usually the the end result of any job that I do is almost always well, is always improved by the collaboration between the editor and the director. It's like a marriage. You know, you hate each other, you love each other, you get on with each other, you fight. Uh, and often you spend a lot of time up late at night as well, so you sort of see the worst of uh, worst of that. Um, creativity. Um, I keep telling people this. I think it's worth stressing, and I did touch on it a little bit earlier, but it is worth stressing that just explore your craziest ideas if you can in VR. I like to mess around in it. I think it's more of a surreal art, art form than it is a real art form. Uh, I think that it's really exciting to just really, you know, put regular footage into VR footage, put it in the headset, look at this like sitting in a giant IMAX video. There's all sorts of things that people could be experimenting with uh, uh, to, to, to keep pushing the whole format forwards. So never let anybody say, oh, you can't do this in VR, you can't do that in VR. You know what you should do? Try it, look at it in VR, and if you like it, that's great. You're the ultimate arbiter of your films. There's no one else. I mean, you've got no other way of judging whether something's good or bad. So, you know, just go for it. Be your, be your own boss. Uh, selecting shots. I got this from, I had a, uh, really my mentor when I started doing commercials. There's a guy called Pete Goddard, who is an excellent uh, film editor in London. And um, he said, basically, look, if you're select, I used to over-select everything. I would like pull the piece I wanted and then a bit extra just in case. But we're using NLEs now. You can always just go back to, you can match frame back to the clip or you can extend it out or whatever. Just select the part of the shot that you think is going in the final film. Don't select any extra. That's not really selecting. You're, you're sort of filtering. If you do that, you will have select roles that are a tenth of the size. It's fantastic. And then your job from that point onwards is much faster. You can put together a great cut. The um, other thing to remember when you're selecting shots is, uh, and I also got this from Pete, is, and this, so we were talking about commercials, but it's equally true in VR. If you find, in any project you've got, if you find the best, let's say you've got three hours of footage, if you find the best 30 shots, right, if you put your bar so high that you're only selecting 30 shots, those are always going to be the best 30 shots. Then make the show out of those shots. Because then nobody's going to be saying, well, have we got a better take on that one? Got It'll all, it's, it's a much faster way of working than it is trying to build the story from the script and put in, well, that's not really a great set of focus, or there's some problem with that shot. Just find the 30 best shots, make that into the story, and then if you have to modify that to follow the script or do something else, then do that. It's really easy in an analytics. It's not going to be um, slowing you down at all. So that's it. That's the end of my uh, dissertation on things I buggered up so you don't have to.